I have some belated thank yous and a belated birthday shout out today. I want to say a huge thank you to those who have donated to my coffee fund, whether through PayPal or Venmo. I call it a coffee fund, but you have all been so generous that some months you are covering my editing expenses, which is huge. I do most of the editing myself, but I do send it to a professional to clean it up so that I am delivering the best audio possible, and you're all making that something that I can do. So I want to say a big thank you to Julie, Reva, Rachel, Jeannie, Maggie, Ella, Marvy, Patricia, Denise, Carly, Kaylin, Bonnie, Dan, Sonia, Mary, Laura, Mallory, Reed, and Sheila. And for the belated birthday shout out, I want to say happy birthday to Douglas. Go have a piece of cake for me and have a great birthday season. When Virginia Uden and her children went missing, her ex-husband Gerald was the prime suspect. But with little evidence to go on, the case went cold. That was until another unrelated disappearance broke this case wide open. I'm Charlie and welcome to Crime Lines. Welcome to Crime Lines. I want to thank James for suggesting this episode, which has ties to Missouri, which is where I live. And it really is a shocking case that I'm surprised I hadn't heard of before this. I do want to shout out the book Alice and Gerald by Ron Francel. I've spoken to him over Messenger about the case a little bit, and we may be able to do an interview about it in the future. It's kind of hard to coordinate schedules sometimes, but it's a really good book that I definitely recommend. Again, the book is titled Alice and Gerald. But we are actually going to start with someone else entirely, and that is Virginia Beard. Virginia was born out east, but when she was under a year old, her parents split up. Her mom, Claire, was a young mom facing raising a child alone in the 1940s and the early 50s, but she was fiercely independent, really a woman ahead of her time. She packed up little Virginia and moved from their home in Pennsylvania all the way to Wyoming, clear across the country, looking for a fresh start. Virginia's father, William, stayed behind in Hershey, Pennsylvania, while Claire made her way in Wyoming. So Virginia grew up the only child of a free-spirited mother, and she, too, forged her own path as an adult. In February of 1968, Virginia was 20 years old, and she found out that she was pregnant. The baby's father was Mert Beard, who was a 38-year-old father of two who worked for Teton National Park as a timber cutter. The two married with Mert's children in attendance, and Virginia moved to Moose, Wyoming, where he lived. Moose is near Jackson Hole, which is close to the Idaho border. The marriage did not last long. The two had not been in a serious relationship when Virginia got pregnant, and they only married because they felt they had to. By the time their son Richard was born eight months into their marriage, they had already been separated for two of those months. After the divorce, Virginia was granted child support, but Richard, for the most part, did not see his father. Two years after Richard was born, Virginia had another son she named Regan. She gave him the same last name that she and Richard used, Beard, though he was not Mert's child. His father doesn't appear to have stuck around, and he certainly wasn't paying child support. Virginia was fortunate with her mother, Claire, who was always supportive, whether Virginia and her sons needed a place to stay or Virginia just needed babysitting. It was hard to make ends meet with two little ones largely on her own, so Virginia took whatever odd job she could, and she also sold used items to make money. One item that Virginia had and hadn't anticipated needing to sell was an old rifle that had been passed down to her from her grandfather. She hung on to it for a while, but when things got really tight, she decided that maybe it was better to have the money than the gun. She asked around, and someone told her that a man in the area, 30-year-old Gerald Uden, would be a good person to appraise the gun for her. He knew all about that sort of thing, and he would be honest with her on the value. 
So in the spring of 1974, Virginia went out to Gerald's place with the 22. He looked it over, and unfortunately, it wasn't worth very much, and it was not really worth selling. But the two started talking about why Virginia was thinking of selling a family heirloom, and she vented about the struggle of raising her boys alone, and that led to a conversation about how she had an endless to-do list at her house and it was just overwhelming her. Gerald offered to come by to help knock some things off her list, and she accepted his help. This was the beginning of their relationship, and three months after meeting, they got married. We know this wasn't Virginia's first hasty marriage, but it also wasn't Gerald's either. He married his first wife after a few months of dating when he was around 21. It ended in divorce after a couple of years. His next marriage happened just as quickly, but didn't last nearly as long. Within six weeks, his wife had left him. About a year later was when he met Virginia, and the old adage, twice bitten, thrice shy, did not hold, because Gerald jumped headfirst into this new marriage, and this time with two stepsons. Gerald had wanted children with his first wife, and he was still hoping to become a father, so he didn't mind taking on the father role for Richard and Reagan. And he and Virginia thought that they should make that role a legal one and have Gerald adopt the boys. They would need permission from Virginia's first husband, which they didn't think would be a problem. Richard was six by this point, and Mert had little to do with him except for sending child support payments. According to Virginia, he didn't send them as frequently as he was ordered to. In March of 1975, with the help of an attorney, Gerald Uden did become the legal father of the brothers Richard and Reagan Beard, and their last names were then changed to Uden. A few months after this, when summer break from school started, Gerald, Virginia, and the boys took a road trip to Pennsylvania to visit family, which included seeing Virginia's father. The trip was going so well that Virginia decided she wanted to stay longer. Gerald had to get back to work, so she suggested that he fly back to Wyoming and she would drive back with the boys later in the season. Gerald agreed, but then after he got home, Virginia kept putting off a return date. As the start of the school year was approaching, Gerald essentially demanded Virginia and the boys come home. She hemmed and hawed a bit, but eventually did go back. A month after returning to Wyoming, though, Virginia filed for divorce. They had been married for 15 months at that point. Gerald complained that Virginia had married him and pushed the adoption just to get him on the hook for child support. This was really some sort of long con, I guess, at least in Gerald's mind. But seeing as this was the third wife to abruptly up and leave Gerald, I think he may be downplaying his own role in why no one seemed to want to stay married to him for very long. When the divorce was all said and done, Gerald was ordered to pay $150 in child support, which the inflation calculator tells me is about $800 a month in today's money. Gerald also had to maintain health insurance on the kids, which was a pretty big deal because the two boys were frequently ill. This was all back when small-town newspapers would publish pretty much anything, including lists of hospital admissions, and I saw little Reagan's name on the list at least twice in two years. And according to the book Alice and Gerald, Richard was actually the more sickly of the two, so medical bills were frequent. Gerald was also given liberal visitation time with his sons, and early on in the separation, it does appear he took advantage of this time with his boys, and he was described as a good father. But the visits became less frequent over time, and the issue, according to Gerald, was that the boys being around made his new wife uncomfortable. Yes, Gerald quickly remarried. Twice bitten, thrice shy, we don't even get to a fourth time, but Gerald sure did. He met Alice Prunty in 1976, three months before his divorce from Virginia was final. And as soon as the ink dried on the divorce judgment, the two got married. Alice was a single mom herself and had been previously married three times. 
She was married the first time at the age of 16 to Gerald Scott. They lived in Illinois, and the marriage lasted 13 years, during which time they had four children. After they divorced, Alice got a job as a licensed practical nurse at a psychiatric hospital where she met Donald Prunty, who was seeking treatment for his depression. The two married, even though patients and nurses should not be in romantic relationships. Donald got a job out in Wyoming, and they moved there with a young daughter they had together. Alice's four older children from her first marriage would spend time between living with their father and other relatives, but sometimes in Wyoming with their mother. It does sound like they bounced around a bit. Donald Prunty was an alcoholic who had high blood pressure. He became suddenly very ill in July of 1973 and died two days later at the hospital of what appeared to be heart and kidney failure. His alcohol abuse was ruled a contributing factor. Alice was again a single mom, this time with five kids, though only one lived with her full time. Alice took a job with a VA hospital in Sheridan, Wyoming, and in July of 1974, a year after her husband died, she met a patient there named Ron Holtz. Ron was 24 years old and already had a long history of behavioral and psychiatric problems, as well as drug use. It was a history that went back to his teen years. In spite of that documented history, Ron was drafted and sent to Vietnam at the age of 18. He served about half of his time before he was sent back home and discharged due to his issues. And then for the next few years, he would rack up a long list of visits to the VA hospital for mental health treatment. Some of those visits were voluntary and some were court-ordered. It was a court-ordered stint that led him to meeting 35-year-old widow Alice Prunty. Ron left the hospital after about two months, and Alice quit her job on that same day. Two weeks later, the two got married. This was the second time Alice, a nurse, married a patient. At this point in time, Alice's older children were not living with her, so it was just her, Ron, and her toddler daughter, who was about a year and a half. Three months after their wedding, in late December 1974, Alice filed for divorce. After trying to have Ron served and failing, the judge granted the divorce in February of 1975, having found that Ron had abandoned his wife. This marriage was so short-lived, Alice rarely told anyone about it. And like her new husband, Gerald, this past of hasty and ill-advised marriages did not deter her this time either. Virginia, Gerald's ex-wife, and Alice, his current wife, never officially met but they certainly did not like each other. Virginia did not want to send her boys to stay at the house of a woman she had never met. And Alice had the mindset that ex-partners were supposed to stay in the past. Having Richard and Reagan around, and by extension Virginia, was not something she entirely welcomed. So Gerald's generous visitation schedule was taken advantage of less and less. Since Gerald wasn't seeing the boys, Virginia didn't think twice when, in July 1978, she decided to move back east. She lived in Pennsylvania for a little bit and then later in New Jersey, staying in touch with Gerald, mostly over financial issues. Sometimes his child support check wouldn't make it to her, or she had to update her address, or the health insurance wasn't reimbursing properly and she needed it to be sorted out. She also wanted more child support as she was having a hard time making ends meet. The child support that had been ordered was based on the idea that Gerald would have the kids at least part of the time, which he did not. Gerald and Alice exchanged a number of angry and ugly letters with Virginia, which you can read more about in the book Alice and Gerald. Alice basically called Virginia trash and a con artist. She even went so far as to express disappointment that the Three Mile Island disaster didn't take Virginia out. They criticized each other on the other one's parenting, and eventually Gerald and Alice started making noise about wanting to see Richard and Reagan. They wanted Virginia to pay to fly the boys out to Wyoming, which was money she didn't have, and They probably knew that. 
they, well, mostly Alice, was bluffing, saying things like how Gerald wouldn't pay child support for the summer while the boys were with him because she knew that money was money Virginia depended on. There were hints at a change of custody and how the boys would be happier with Gerald and Alice. There were threats of legal action with Virginia being held in contempt if she didn't get the boys back to Wyoming. Now, if you think for a minute any of this was because of a deep desire to be in Richard and Regan's lives, it definitely wasn't. And we know that it wasn't because Gerald came straight out and said so in a letter. He told Virginia the only way to stop this train he was setting in motion was to have the adoption vacated. That was the end goal, to scare Virginia into freeing him from those monthly child support payments. Alice was a bit more subtle about the goal, but it was clearly her intent as well. However, it did not work. Virginia was not finding things easy out east. She was bouncing between apartments and jobs, and now with the threat of being held in contempt if she didn't make visits easier for Gerald, she decided to put her large items in storage and loaded what she could fit into her car. In June of 1980, she, Richard, and Regan moved back to Riverton, Wyoming. Gerald found out they were back in town when Virginia contacted him to let him know where to mail the child support check to her mom's house. So he called Virginia at her mom's and asked to see his kids for a visit at his house. Virginia agreed, even though she was uncomfortable with it, since Alice continued to refuse to meet her. But she didn't really have a choice other than to send them for the requested visit. Over the next couple of months, the boys went to Gerald's for an overnight a few times, and they did play with Alice's daughter while they were there. But not everything was great. The boys would go home and tell their grandmother Claire about some concerning things, like how they had to sleep alone in a trailer with a mattress on the floor. And then there was an incident where Gerald decided he was going to teach the boys to swim, supposedly. He had them jump in the lake from his boat and then swim back to the boat. Except as they swam, he kept going farther and farther away. Eventually, Gerald was too far away for them to swim to, and they were screaming for help for a while until he and Alice came back for them. They were ages 9 and 11 at the time. But oddly towards Virginia, Gerald seemed to have softened a bit. He wasn't friendly, but he wasn't being abrasive and insulting, which in this case was an improvement. And then he offered to do Virginia a favor. When she returned to Wyoming, she had left a bunch of belongings back in New Jersey. She had saved up about $1,000 in cash to get a truck to go back to get the things. But Gerald said he had met a guy who had a flatbed trailer and he was willing to loan it to Virginia for free. That $1,000 was pretty much the entirety of Virginia's savings, so not having to use as much of it would be a huge help. Gerald said that she could come out to his property to see the trailer the next day, which was Friday, September 12, 1980, and he told her to go ahead and bring the boys because he could take them bird hunting since he had the day off. So Virginia and the boys headed out in her mother Claire's station wagon around 1.30 p.m. on that Friday. Gerald had suggested she bring her 22 rifle along so the boys could use it for hunting. Claire expected the three to be back by dinner, but they didn't show up. Virginia was impulsive and sometimes made last-minute plans without calling Claire, so she wasn't really that worried about it until it was getting closer to the boys' bedtime. Around 9 p.m., she finally called Gerald to see what was going on. But instead of getting to ask him where Virginia was, it was Gerald who asked her that first, clearly angry. He told Claire that they were supposed to meet at two, and he sat around for an hour waiting for his sons, only for Virginia not to show. Claire explained that they had left, headed towards Gerald's house, several hours before. Now she was concerned something had happened between her home and Gerald's, which was only about a half an hour drive. Claire had a friend come pick her up, and they drove around searching for any sign of the car. Gerald eventually joined them searching, but they found nothing that night. 
So in the morning, Claire went to the police to report 32-year-old Virginia, 11-year-old Robert, and 10-year-old Regan missing, and the police officer basically told her he'd come over later to get more information. Claire pushed him, not wanting to wait, but to immediately start searching. However, her impression was that the officer wasn't that worried about a 32-year-old woman not reporting in with her mother. So Claire went home and printed up posters to put all around town herself. The police soon learned that Virginia was planning on heading back east to get her things, so they assumed that must be where she was. She was expected to move into a new place by the end of the month, so surely she'd turn up by then. But Claire knew this was a bizarre assumption since, according to Gerald, Virginia never showed up to pick up the trailer, and the cash in the jar that Virginia had saved for the trip was left behind. With no money and not even a change of clothing, Virginia wouldn't have suddenly decided to drive across the country with two children. Except maybe she did if you go by a letter Claire got. It was about a week after she last saw Virginia and the boys when she received a mailgram. The way a mailgram worked was that you contacted a service, usually by telephone, And you would give them your message, they would type it up, and send it out for rapid delivery through the post office. It's basically a postal telegram, aka a mailgram. It was faster than postal mail and more reliable when it came to delivery. This letter was received by Claire in Wyoming on September 20th, and it had been mailed the day before from Illinois. It was supposedly from Virginia and basically said she had left town because she was in trouble, but she and the boys were okay. She asked her mom to cover for her, and if anyone asked, she was in California. Claire didn't think the letter made sense for a few reasons. One that she told the media at the time was that the note was signed Virginia. She never knew her daughter to sign cards or letters with anything except her nickname, either Jin or Ginny. Second, it seems strange that this was sent through the mail at all. It wouldn't have cost much more to just make a phone call, which is how Virginia usually communicated with her family. And lastly, let's get back to that $1,000 in the jar. If Virginia needed to go on the run, that money would have helped a lot. Why leave it behind? So Claire decided to investigate a bit and sent a mailgram of her own to the address in Illinois. Then on September 23rd, two days later, a second letter showed up, supposedly from Virginia. Virginia wrote that she had made it to Pennsylvania and that it was safer for everyone if no one knew exactly where she was. This letter was also signed Virginia rather than Jin or Ginny, which made Claire suspicious. But even more glaring was the postmark. The letter had not been mailed from Pennsylvania. It had been mailed in Riverton, Wyoming. So Claire took the correspondence and her concerns back to the police, who saw things differently. Ignoring the red flags that Claire pointed out, they told Claire this was good news. It was proof to them that Virginia was okay and that they were right that she had just headed out east. Without actually seeing or talking to Virginia, Richard, or Reagan Uden directly, The police closed the missing persons' cases, noting that Virginia had been located safe in Illinois. Obviously, Claire was not convinced, so she sent a second mailgram to that Illinois address after not hearing back from the first one. After she sent it, she got a phone call from a woman who identified herself as Joyce Johnson. She said she saw Virginia and the boys in Illinois and all was well. She gave Virginia the money she needed to get to Pennsylvania. Which, by the way, none of Virginia's family in Pennsylvania had any contact with her. On September 25th, a third letter showed up at Claire's house, but this one was not from Virginia. It was from the person who lived at the Illinois address. They wrote that some lady had paid them to send the mailgram, but that's all the contact they had, and they asked Claire to stop contacting them. 
Claire took this letter to the police and asked them to at least figure out who lived at the address and see if they had any more information about where Virginia went. The police agreed to do this, and they found the woman who sent the mailgram. Her name was Teresa. With the police there, the story of what exactly happened changed a bit. She said that she never talked to Virginia at all, and Virginia was not the person who asked Teresa to send the mailgram. Rather, it was Teresa's mother who called her and said she had a friend who needed help getting a message to Claire. Teresa agreed to send the message that her mother had passed on to her. Teresa was upset when she later learned that Virginia was missing, and she confronted her mother about possibly roping her into something. Her mother told her it was just a misunderstanding. And her mother was Alice Uden, Gerald's new wife. The mail that was supposedly from Virginia had been sent, it appeared, on the order of her ex-husband's new wife. This started to change the official police opinion that Virginia took her boys and drove off. Things were starting to look suspicious. So with this revelation, the police interviewed both Gerald and Alice separately. They both denied being involved in the disappearance, insisting that Virginia and her boys never showed up that day. Alice did admit to the police that she was behind the two letters, but denied directing the phone call from supposedly Joyce Johnson. But she said she wasn't trying to cover anything up. Rather, she was trying to smoke Virginia out. She thought Virginia, and possibly even Claire, were playing some sort of game with this disappearing act. Maybe they were even trying to set Gerald up for something. Sending the letters would stir things up and maybe uncover what was really going on. But it didn't. No one had heard from Virginia, and with the letters being proven bogus, the missing persons cases were reopened for all three of them, Virginia, Richard, and Reagan. And then a week and a half later, on October 4th, the missing car was found. It had actually been found at least two times before this and reported, but no one connected it to Virginia and the boys because, honestly, no one was really looking for them. No one except Claire. But by October 4th, the circumstances were suspicious enough that when a hunter called the car's location in, the investigators jumped into action. The car was found near Dickinson Park, which is not between Claire's house and Gerald's. It was actually well over an hour away in the wrong direction. The car was about 75 feet down in a canyon, caught up on some rocks and brush. It was obvious at the scene that this wasn't an unintentional plunge into the canyon. For one thing, there was a rag in the gas tank, leading the police to believe that there may have also been an attempt to set the car on fire prior to someone rolling it off the edge of the canyon. And then, after the car got stuck on the rocks, someone had pulled over large branches and tried to cover up the car. There were no bodies found in the car, and initially the police saw nothing of evidentiary value. They didn't even impound the car, but rather returned it immediately to Claire. Claire was not convinced they looked hard enough, so she got into the station wagon and started looking around. She noticed brown stains in the cargo area, including some that looked like spatter. She called the police, who then processed the car tested the brown stains, and learned the substance was blood. When they fully processed the car, they found that there had been a significant amount of blood in that cargo area had they only looked more closely. Without DNA testing at the time, they could only do blood type testing, and all of the blood came back as type A, the same as Virginia Uden. After the car was found, the reporting on these disappearances really picked up in the media, and the police told the Associated Press that they knew who had sent the letters and who had made the phone call, but they wouldn't say who it was. They did say the letters were related to the disappearance. So while they didn't name Alice to the public at that point, if Alice happened to read that article, she would know the police had not bought her story. 
I don't know if this was intentional or not, but it definitely comes across to me as a way to apply a little pressure on Alice. Claire told the media that because of the blood, she did believe that her only child was dead, but she refused to give up hope that the boys would come home. She said she could imagine a scenario where Virginia was killed, but the boys were sent to live out of state. Though she didn't tell this to the media at the time, Claire believed Gerald had killed her daughter. She thought he was capable of that, but she had a hard time imagining him killing two boys, one only 10 years old and the other about to turn 12. The investigators were not holding on to as much hope as Claire was, and they were trying to make up for lost time. You know, the first three weeks where they fell for two sloppily attempted letters. Searches were conducted, especially in the area where the car was found, but nothing conclusive was uncovered. On November 14th, Alice and Gerald were back at the police station for questioning again, and these interviews were longer and more pressure was being applied. Alice cried during her interview, and Gerald had a moment where he seemed about to break. He was visibly shaking, but he managed to collect himself and essentially said that even if he did do something to them, the police had no bodies and they could not prove a crime. Both Gerald and Alice refused a polygraph, and without much evidence, they were released. Claire, who was frustrated with the investigation, ended up turning to psychics for help. Two local psychics had come in with no success, but then in 1981, Claire read about John Ketchings in the National Enquirer. John Ketchings was located in Dallas, and he had actually generated leads for the police that turned out to be fruitful. And this is a good time to mention that the True Crime Podcast Festival is happening in August in Austin, and I will be doing a live show with my co-host from Crime Lines and Consequences. We are going to cover a psychic who had a 0% success rate with missing persons cases. So just a plug to go get your tickets if you're going to be in the Austin area in late August. Come see Eric and I talk about that case. Now, the psychic Eric and I will be covering is not John Ketchings. Some sources give him a 60% success rate, but he himself said that he was right 20% of the time, wrong 20% of the time, and had mixed results the other 60%, where he had some details correct and others were wrong. The police in Wyoming were willing to work with him because, frankly, they had nothing else to do on the case, and they didn't expect they would have more leads until they found the bodies. Taking John around town to get his feelings on the case wouldn't take away from pursuing other leads because they had no other leads. The police said John seemed sincere and they were impressed with him. He wasn't doing some sideshow psychic routine like they expected. John Ketchings did announce afterwards that he knew where the bodies were and searches were conducted, though I couldn't find in the newspaper articles anything drawing a direct line between his promptings and any of the searches. Regardless, none of them led to the remains. The FBI came in to help in the investigation in March of 1982, and seven months later, in October, a grand jury was held. Gerald and Alice were both called to testify, and they both pleaded the fifth. In the end, the prosecutors didn't even have the grand jurors deliberate. They just thanked them and dismissed them without asking for an indictment because they knew their case was not strong enough. In April of 1983, the authorities announced officially that they had a prime suspect, but just not enough evidence. Though this announcement made the news, it wasn't exactly news to anyone who lived in the area. Gerald and Alice were living under a cloud of suspicion, and not just a cloud. What would cast a bigger shadow than a cloud? Like a skyscraper? They were under a skyscraper of suspicion. Gerald worried that without justice in the courts, someone may attempt vigilante justice on him. So almost as soon as the grand jury was over, he and Alice packed up and left the state with Alice's youngest daughter. After they left, an investigator went out to Gerald's property to look around and see if there were any clues in plain sight, maybe some evidence of a makeshift grave, but he saw nothing. (laughs) 
And Claire continued to plead for information for years, depositing money from every one of her paychecks into an account for a reward fund. Meanwhile, Alice and Gerald were reestablishing themselves in Missouri in the Springfield area. Alice was originally from the Midwest, so for her, it was like going home. Gerald went to school to become a truck driver, while Alice worked as a nurse until she also became a trucker. They would even do their long-haul trips together. They came back on the radar when Alice's youngest daughter, Erica, was around 15 or 16, and she got into an argument with Gerald, and Gerald hit her. Child services got involved, and she was removed from the home. Outside of her parents' influence, investigators from Wyoming thought it was their best chance to talk to her about what had happened to her stepbrothers. Erica was only eight at the time they went missing, and she did remember that she had to go to her grandparents' house that day, and she wasn't used to that. Usually when Richard and Reagan would come over, she would play with them, so she was disappointed that she couldn't stay and play. But her mom told her she didn't want her around the boys anymore. Erica also remembered that after they went missing, Gerald removed their photos from the family album. But that's all she really knew. It gave the police more suspicion, particularly about how much Alice knew about what was going on, but it wasn't direct evidence. The next lead in the case came in 1992 or 93, but it wasn't exactly this case. A man named Todd approached a police investigator he knew and said he wanted to report a murder. He claimed his mother, Alice Uden, had drunkenly confessed to him that she had shot and killed a man she previously dated. According to what Todd had been told, this man, Ron, was abusive towards her and threatening towards Alice's then-toddler daughter. One night when Ron was asleep, Alice grabbed his 22 rifle and shot him in the back of the head. She then put his body into her trunk and dumped it down an old mine on a ranch she previously worked at called Remount Ranch. Todd's memory was fuzzy and he couldn't give the police much, not even Ron's last name, but he felt he had to get this off of his chest. This was definitely not a tip the investigators were expecting to get. If someone came to them and said Alice Uden was involved in a murder, they would have assumed it was about Virginia or Richard or Reagan. They even asked Todd if he happened to know anything about that case, but he didn't. He suspected his mom was involved or knew something, but he didn't have direct knowledge, just his own belief. All he had knowledge of was this murder confession, the murder of a man the police had never even heard of. There were no missing persons reports in the area for someone named Ron or Ronald in that time period. Because Todd's memory wasn't entirely clear, they wondered if that was even the guy's name. So they looked at other missing persons reports from that time period just to see if Alice's name showed up as a witness or someone they talked to. But the only other case she was tied to was Virginia and the boys. So the police reached out to another of Alice's children, her daughter, Teresa. She admitted that Alice had told her a similar story about shooting an abusive partner, and she also remembered the man's name was Ron. And she thought his last name was Holt or Holtz, which gave the investigators a little more to work with. There was no record of a Ron or Ronald Holt or Holtz in the state of Wyoming, but by branching out to neighboring states, they got a hit. Alice had married Ron Holtz in Colorado. The investigators reached out to his surviving family and found out that no one had heard from Ron since Christmas of 1974, right around the time Alice filed for divorce. In the 20 years since then, the family had not reported him missing. Ron was mentally unstable, and he attempted suicide a few times. He had drifted in and out of their lives, and due to his violent tendencies, they didn't really mind when he stayed away. The investigators learned that Ron was married before Alice. He was young at the time. It was just after he got out of the service, and he had a daughter who was born in 1971. Ron wasn't in her life much after he and his wife divorced when she was an infant, so they also hadn't reported him missing. 
A check of Ron's social security number and his VA record showed that all activity stopped in December of 1974. He didn't file any tax returns or have a job using that social security number, and he never sought care through the VA again, in spite of having done so multiple times previously. By the time the divorce was final in February, Ron had been missing for two months. So the first step after having this 20-year-old cold case suddenly dropped into their laps was to search Remount Ranch for any sign of Ron's body, which they did for the first time in 1994. There was a gold mine shaft on the ranch that was 90 feet deep and had been used as a trash pit of sorts for decades. The trash mostly consisted of animal carcasses, and the mine helped keep the smell from being noticeable. A full search would be expensive and time-consuming, seeing as how many animal bones there were to sort through. Plus, there were safety concerns about the integrity of a 100-year-old mine. A search down through the stable parts of the mine found nothing. Over the next 10 years, there would be another search of the ranch and more interviews with Alice's adult children. It was in 2005 that the investigators decided it was time to confront Alice directly and see if they could rattle her. And rattle her they did. This was the first time the police had talked to Alice since the grand jury back in the early 80s. She was now in her 60s. Alice assumed they were there to talk to her about Virginia and the boys. The investigators did not immediately tell her that's not what they wanted to talk about. So they slowly warmed Alice up by asking personal history questions like when did she and Gerald get married and had she been married before? As Alice walked through her marriage history, she skipped right on over Ron Holtz. She went from Donald Prunty straight to Gerald. The investigators nodded along as she completely omitted her marriage to Ron from the narrative and they gave away nothing. Alice was still thinking this was about Virginia, Richard, and Reagan, so she told the investigators that she had saved various notes and articles and paperwork from the time of the disappearance that might be helpful. She promised to bring it into them the next day, which she did. When she showed up the following day, they asked her if they could talk to her about a few more things, and she sat down, probably ready to repeat her story about Virginia and the boys but instead they immediately mentioned Ron Holtz. At the sound of his name, Alice fell out of her chair, literally. According to the book Alice and Gerald, she literally leaned to the left, hit the wall, and fell to the floor. When she picked herself up, she said, my kids told you. Alice explained that she left Ron out of her personal narrative the day before since the marriage was barely a blip on the radar in her life. With no shared children, she never heard from him after they split up so early in their marriage. And she didn't like to admit, as a nurse, that she had married a patient, a patient who turned out to be abusive. So basically, she left out that marriage because it was irrelevant and embarrassing. Alice didn't exactly deny telling her kids that she shot and killed Ron, but she denied that the story was true. She had told them it as some sort of cautionary tale against drinking or something like that. Most parents do tell their kids cautionary tales about misadventures and maybe sometimes will exaggerate how bad things were to just really warn them, but I have never once met anyone who wrongfully confessed to a murder to teach their kids a lesson. The investigators probably hadn't either, so obviously they pushed Alice on this, even pointing out how strange it was that two people Alice hated, Ron and Virginia, were both missing. But she insisted she had nothing to do with either. And without evidence to the contrary, she again walked out of the police station, just as she had every other time they questioned her in the 25 years since Virginia, Richard, and Reagan went missing. (laughs) 
In 2008, there was a search of Gerald Uden's old property in Wyoming, and all the police told the media at the time was that it was based on a tip that had come in. In the book Alice and Gerald, we learned that the tip was that Gerald once told his stepdaughter that the best way to dispose of a body was with pigs. So a lot of this search included the old pig pen on the property where they carefully sifted for any bone fragments, and they found nothing. In all this time, Virginia's mother Claire still held out hope she would eventually get answers. But in April of 2013, Claire died at the age of 92 without them. But the world would soon have everything revealed. Or almost everything. It was in 2013 that the investigators decided to search the gold mine again to look for the remains of Ron Holtz. This would be a bigger search, a deeper search, thanks to students from the University of Wyoming's Anthropology Department. This would be a hands on learning experience for them in how to excavate a historical site and, without having to pay the heavy labor costs for the work, the police department was able to afford this operation. For two days, they pulled out who knows how many large animal bones. Those weren't too bad since they could easily be identified as non-human and tossed to the side. It was the sifting through the dirt for small bones and teeth that was the time-consuming process. And then, among a growing pile of smaller bones, they found a human metatarsal. At that point, they were 45 feet down, the equivalent of about four stories. They were then able to excavate more human bones, almost the complete skeleton. And most importantly to the case, they found a skull which showed a gunshot wound to the back of the head. Using DNA extracted from the bone marrow and teeth, they were able to compare the John Doe to Ron Holtz's daughter, the one who hadn't seen him since she was six months old. It was a match, and with that, the police were ready to once again confront Alice Uden, but this time with evidence. In September of 2013, the police pulled up to Alice and Gerald's home and found 74-year-old Alice home alone as Gerald was out on a long-haul drive. She agreed to talk at the station, and it seems that she thought, once again, this was going to be about Virginia. Instead, they asked her about Ron Holtz. She claimed she had kicked him out after just a few months of marriage because he had threatened to kill her daughter and she hadn't heard from him since then. Then they told her that they had found his body, right where she had told her children she put it. And after a little back and forth, few more denials, Alice was finally ready to tell the story, or at least a version of it. Alice said that one day, in late December 1974, Ron came home from work and he heard Alice's daughter, Erica, crying in her crib. According to Alice, the sound of crying was a trigger for Ron's temper. In a different statement, Alice would say that Ron was actually sleeping when the little girl's crying woke him up. Regardless, as he heard Erica cry, he got enraged and went into her room, saying he was going to kill her. Alice was sure that he was going to hurt Erica, so she grabbed the twenty-two rifle and followed him in there. While he had his back to Alice, she put the gun against the back of his head and fired. Ron slumped over the crib, dead, and Alice had to figure out what to do with his body. Because this was around Christmas time, she noticed that the cardboard barrel where she usually stored her Christmas decor happened to be empty. So she crammed Ron's body into it. Alice then drove her daughter to Ron's family's home and asked them if they could watch her for the night. She explained that she was kicking Ron out of the house and she wanted her daughter safely out of the way. By the time Alice told this version of the story, Ron's parents had died, and so I'm not sure this has been confirmed. Alice said she then drove back to their trailer in Wyoming and got the barrel out to the porch. She drove her car up to the porch and dropped the barrel into the trunk. And then she went out to Remount Ranch, rolled the barrel out of her trunk, down a small hill, and into the mine. 
She told the police that she went home to clean up, but found that there was only a little blood on her mattress. They stopped her here to clarify because she said he was shot in her daughter's room. So why was there blood on her mattress? And she said she couldn't remember how it got there. While they had Alice talking, they wanted to get some more information on that other case we've been talking about this entire episode, Virginia, Richard, and Reagan. So they told Alice that they wanted to go to the DA and let them know that Alice was telling the whole truth and she was fully cooperating, but they couldn't do that because they felt she was holding back. And that's when they brought up Virginia and the boys. Now, Alice was done talking at this point and denied knowing anything about those disappearances and claimed Gerald didn't even tell her anything. But even though the situation didn't work out as leverage against Alice to get her to talk about it, they thought they might still be able to use it against someone else and finally find out what happened to Virginia, Richard, and Reagan. With Alice Uden in custody for the murder of Ron Holtz, they had an officer call Gerald, who was on the road, and pose as a home health care provider. She said that Alice had been arrested and she didn't know what to do and could someone come home right away. There was some expectation that Gerald would then immediately head home to help his wife, but he didn't. So then they had an FBI agent call him and tell him it was time to come back to Missouri. Gerald said he would come home, but not until he finished the job he was on the road doing. Gerald, while still on the road, wrote a letter to his extended family saying that he was about to be charged with murder. He admitted in the letter that he was guilty, but he said that Alice was innocent. You see, no one had told him what murder Alice was arrested for, and he assumed it had to do with Virginia, Richard, and Reagan. As Gerald promised the FBI agent, he did finish the job, and he drove home after mailing the letter to an extended family member. At home, he gave some of his things to his grandson while he waited on the police to show up and arrest him. The authorities did show up, and they spoke to Gerald at the house where he was led to believe that Alice had been arrested over the disappearances of Virginia and the boys. They didn't say that was what this was about. They referred to it just as, quote, what happened in Wyoming. So Gerald spoke to the police under the assumption they must have found some evidence that implicated them in Virginia, Richard, and Reagan's disappearances in order to have arrested Alice. Gerald had already decided that he was going to confess to get Alice off the hook completely, not fully realizing she was on the hook for something else entirely. Without much prompting at all, Gerald told the police what happened. Like Alice, it would be only one version of the story he would tell. Gerald said he had killed them and Alice had nothing to do with it. The motive, according to Gerald, was that he was stuck between these two women, his ex-wife, who he had to give $150 to each month, and his new wife, who resented those $150 payments. He said he knew he had a problem on his hands, and he decided to solve it. Those were his exact words. He described a triple homicide, including two children, as a solution to a problem he had. Gerald told the police that he hatched the plan one day when he was at the hospital visiting Richard. That was the first time Virginia mentioned something to him about needing a trailer to bring things to Wyoming from New Jersey. Gerald now realized he had an in to get her alone with her guard down by claiming he found a trailer for her to borrow. So Virginia and the boys did show up that day at the corner where he told them to meet him. He got into the car with them to direct Virginia to a hunting area he picked out. They pulled over where he said to, and everyone got out of the car. Gerald told the boys that he had to test fire their twenty-two that Virginia had brought first to make sure it worked. After he fired one shot and knew that the gun was firing well, Gerald immediately turned to Virginia and shot her in the back of the head. He then shot Richard so quickly that the little boy didn't even react to what just happened to his mother. Reagan, however, started to run, but he tripped. While he was on the ground, Gerald fired, killing him as well. Gerald then put all three bodies in the back of Virginia's mother's car and drove home. He moved the bodies into his truck and drove them out to the Oregon coast to dump them in the water. 
They would be so far gone at this point, they would never be found. He then dumped the station wagon in the canyon. Though Gerald claimed he didn't get any pleasure out of the killings, he recounted what happened as though he didn't really care either. He said the deaths stopped the child support, which would have cost him $16,000 by the time it was all said and done. Gerald denied that Alice was involved in any way, so the investigators asked how he got back down from the canyon. He drove the station wagon up, dumped it, and then what? How did he get home? Gerald claimed he walked. The walk home was at least 20 miles. It would have taken him 8 to 10 hours. It would make much more sense if Alice had followed him up there in their car and drove him home. But Gerald denied it. Alice was not involved in any way. This story would change a bit shortly after he confessed. Not the part about Alice's involvement. Not yet, at least. This story would change a bit shortly after he confessed, but not the part about Alice, though. Not yet, at least. Less than a month after Gerald confessed, a plea deal was signed that he would plead guilty in exchange for the death penalty being taken off the table. A condition of the deal was that he would have to testify in court as to what happened, and he had to tell the truth. In court in November of 2013, Gerald told the same basic story, but rather than dumping the bodies off the coast, he said he actually put the bodies in an old gold mine. Not the same one Ron Holtz was found in. Wyoming has hundreds of abandoned mines. But the bodies didn't stay there because after the car was found, Gerald was afraid a search would uncover them. So he went back to the mine on November 5th, 1980, two months after the murders, and put the bodies in drums. He then drove them out to Fremont Lake, took his boat out to the deepest part of the lake, and dropped the barrels in. Gerald also claimed in court that the child support wasn't a major motive, even though in his confession to the police, he told them the exact amount of money killing the boys saved him. He said he could have afforded the payments, but it was the wedge Virginia was putting between him and Alice that was the problem. He called Virginia a predator who trapped him under false pretenses to adopt her children and said the strain that she put on his life was intolerable. As for why he killed the boys and not just Virginia, he said he eventually came to see all three of the victims as the problem in his relationship with Alice and he knew if he killed one, he'd have to kill them all to get away with it. He didn't exactly apologize for what he did, but he did acknowledge there was no excuse. With Gerald's guilty plea, he was then sentenced to life in prison and sent there at the age of 71. Alice, however, was going to trial. Before the trial, she changed her story to say that Ron was asleep when she shot him, like she had told her children, but it was still because he was abusive. But by the time trial came around, she was back to the story that he was awake and about to attack her daughter. Another thing that happened after the arrest but before the trial was that Alice was then investigated for another death, that of her second husband, Donald. He had died after a couple of days in the hospital, having become rather suddenly ill after years of alcohol abuse. By pulling the medical files and looking at it with a more critical eye, the investigator saw that the symptoms Donald presented with were the same as someone suffering from ethylene glycol poisoning. This is what is seen when someone is poisoned with antifreeze. They did exhume Donald's body in an attempt to test it for signs of poisoning, but there was no soft tissue left to test. Donald was reburied, left to rest in peace, but with a lot more suspicion on his now 75-year-old widow. She was going to trial for the one killing they could prove happened in May of 2014. Two of Alice's adult children testified for the state about the story Alice told them, that Ron was sleeping when he was shot. Her son Todd testified about how he tried to tell people about what his mother had done for years, but it took a long time for there to be any major effort to find Ron's remains. By the time of this trial, Todd had been estranged from his mother for decades. When Alice mouthed the words, I love you, to him in court, he yelled back, I hate you. The judge called for a recess so everyone could calm down. <laughs> 
The state did have a forensic pathologist testify as to the trajectory of the bullet, and he said it was consistent with someone standing above the victim while the victim was lying down, not someone coming up behind him while they were both standing. But the pathologist did concede on cross-examination that if Ron was standing but bending over the side of the crib, it would put Alice above him and would be consistent with the evidence. Alice testified in her own defense, and I imagine the jury had to transport themselves back to see Alice as the young woman she was at the time, and not the frail, elderly woman in front of them with hearing aids and sitting in a wheelchair. The state, on cross-examination of Alice, brought up some inconsistencies in her various statements about what happened. You know how in one version he came home from work and was upset, the other he woke up and he was upset, in the other he was sleeping the whole time and not attacking anyone at all, but at this point Alice stuck to her trial story. The jury deliberated for a day and a half before finding Alice Uden not guilty of the first-degree murder of Ron Holtz, but rather guilty of the lesser-included offense of second-degree murder. Essentially, the state proved murder, but not premeditation. At sentencing, a victim's advocate read a letter from Ron Holtz's daughter, who never really knew him. She wrote about how she had spent some of her adult life looking for her father, who she didn't know was dead. She said she prays for Alice's children, but wants Alice to know she is not forgiven. The defense argued that Alice was a battered wife in an abusive relationship in the 1970s when resources were few, particularly in rural areas. Her attorney asked for leniency, not just because of Alice's state of mind at the time of the murder, but also because her youngest child was currently terminally ill with cancer and only had six months to live. He said the state was seeking punishment for punishment's sake, as Alice was clearly no danger to the community. The state had requested a sentence of 23 to 26 years, saying that a criminal getting away with something for 40 years doesn't mean there shouldn't be justice. As for Alice, she told the judge that she accepted whatever sentence was given to her and that she wished she never met Ron. She tried to get out of the relationship, but no one would help. She prayed for his soul and put her trust in God. Alice had, in the years since moving to Missouri, become very religious. She closed her statement saying that she asked God to let her be free long enough to finish raising her youngest child, and he had allowed her to do that. When the judge had his turn to speak, he said that the murder of Ron Holtz was cold and calculated, regardless of the circumstances Alice was in in 1974 or present day. He then sentenced her to life in prison. I do want to say that thankfully, the information that Alice's daughter only had six months to live did not turn out to be true. Not saying they didn't think it was true at the time, I have no idea on that, but she did survive. And the reason I've used her name is she has done a number of interviews about the case. As far as I can tell, she's still alive today, nearly a decade later, and that is one bit of good news that I can give. Alice was never charged in connection with the murders of Virginia, Richard, or Reagan. She denied involvement, and Gerald did not implicate her. The opposite, in fact. He went out of his way to exonerate her. But it certainly didn't escape the investigators' notice that Ron Holtz was killed with a twenty-two and his body put in a mine shaft, and that's exactly what happened to Virginia, Richard, and Reagan. But they could never prove Alice's involvement, so she could not be charged. In prison, Gerald and Alice were not allowed to have direct contact with each other, but Gerald would occasionally shift money on his books over to Alice's books to make sure she had whatever she needed. Even after they were in prison, there were searches of the lake Gerald claimed he put the bodies in in 2013, 14, and 15, but they could not find any sign of Virginia or the boys, so they decided to offer Gerald a deal. If he told them where he really put the bodies, he would be allowed a visit with Alice, whose health and memory were fading. Gerald told them that he already told them where the bodies were, and he couldn't help any more than that. So Gerald was not in direct contact with Alice when, in June 2019, at the age of 80, Alice was transported to a medical center where she died of renal failure. 
Within two days, Gerald managed to break through his grief and immediately try to pin the murders he confessed to onto Alice. He did a complete 180, claiming she also killed her second husband, Don, and that he asked Alice to take responsibility for all the crimes she had committed, but she had refused. Gerald then petitioned to have his guilty plea overturned based on factual innocence. Factual innocence requires new evidence to prove said innocence, not just a man pointing the finger at his very recently dearly departed wife. All Gerald offered up was his say-so, so his request was dismissed. He appealed to the Supreme Court, who found they did not have jurisdiction. When I asked Ron Francel, the author of Alice and Gerald, his thoughts on Gerald's new claims, I asked him over Facebook Messenger. He told me that he thinks it was a desperate, dead wives tell no tales, roll of the dice, and it went nowhere fast. In the end, Virginia, Richard, and Regan Uden, along with Ron Holtz, got justice, which is the hope of any cold case. The investigators spent decades looking for leads to chase down, and I'm sure they were very happy to close the book on these cases. Thank you for listening. You can find Crime Lines on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and occasionally TikTok. Crime Lines is on Patreon, where I offer early and ad-free episodes, as well as bonus content. Visit patreon.com slash crime lines. If you want to buy me a coffee, the official drink of Crime Lines, you can give a one-time donation at basementfortproductions.com slash support. And if you need a palate cleanser after listening to heavier true crime shows, check out Rusty Hinges, an allegedly funny history, mystery, and true crime show that I co-created and write for.